In this PowerPoint, we're going to examine the influence of catalysts and the different steps in a reaction mechanism on the overall rate of a reaction. Let's start with catalysts. A catalyst is a substance that influences the rate of a reaction without being consumed in the reaction. And it works by providing an alternative reaction mechanism for the process that essentially has a lower activation energy associated with the transition state with the catalyst than the transition state without the catalyst. A classic example of a catalyzed process is the destruction of ozone in the stratosphere to create the ozone hole. So the stratosphere is the layer of the atmosphere approximately 20 kilometers up from the surface of the Earth. And at this level, ozone gas is naturally produced by the interaction of molecular oxygen, O2, with UV light. At the same time, UV light can interact with the ozone molecules and decompose them back into molecular oxygen and an oxygen radical. An oxygen radical is just a neutral single atom of oxygen. So these two processes, production and decomposition, when undisturbed, are in equilibrium. And this means that the rates are equal. As fast as an ozone molecule is destroyed by UV light, another is produced from molecular oxygen. So under natural conditions, the levels of ozone in the stratosphere stay relatively constant. But the ozone hole has developed because of catalyzed ozone destruction that results from the introduction of long-lived man-made molecules into the stratosphere. And the classic example of this is the chlorine radical, a single neutral atom of chlorine, that's produced from the decomposition of halogen-containing industrial molecules like freons in the stratosphere. So at that level, the high levels of UV light provide the energy to essentially decompose those uh, freon molecules, which are considered relatively stable, and uh, break off the chlorine. That chlorine radical can then extract a oxygen from a molecule of ozone. And it forms a reaction intermediate known as chlorine monoxide. It also produces a uh, molecular oxygen molecule. The chlorine monoxide then interacts in a second step with an oxygen radical that's present already in the stratosphere. And that oxygen radical then accepts the oxygen from chlorine monoxide to produce more molecular oxygen and reproduce the chlorine radical. So chlorine is, an, is a catalyst. It's consumed in an earlier step and uh, produced again or released again in a later step. And because the catalyzed process is faster than the natural destruction process of ozone, the ozone is consumed more quickly than it's produced in the stratosphere. And we get ozone depletion. The catalyzed destruction process is much quicker than the uncatalyzed process because it has a lower activation energy, as can be seen in this energy diagram. So the single step uncatalyzed pathway is represented by the red line and the catalyzed pathway by the blue line. There are two activation energies for the catalyzed pathway associated with the activation energies for each of the individual steps in the mechanism. Both of these are lower than, the, than that of the uncatalyzed process, though, and more molecules will have enough energy to overcome the activation barrier for the catalyzed pathway than the uncatalyzed one. As a result, the rate is faster for the catalyzed pathway. When we can break down a net process into multiple steps, we call these steps a reaction mechanism. And each is known as an elementary step, and it represents one collision or interaction that occurs with the molecules involved in that net process. If we add together the elementary steps, we get the net process. Now, not all the molecules that collide and interact in the elementary steps, though, may show up in the net observed process. The catalyst chlorine, for example, is a reactant in the first step 
and a product in the second. As a result, it cancels itself out when we add the two steps together. And this is another way of defining a catalyst. It's consumed in an early step and produced again in a later one. Another molecule that cancels out when we add together the elementary steps is the chlorine monoxide. So it's a reaction intermediate. It's something that's produced in an early step and consumed in a later one. And in many reactions with multiple steps, you never see the reaction intermediates because they're consumed as quickly as they are produced. So catalysts come in two forms, homogeneous catalysts and heterogeneous catalysts. A homogeneous catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants. And the chlorine radical and ozone destruction is a good example of this. Both the chlorine radical and the ozone are in the gas phase. Homogeneous catalysts work by reacting with one of the reactant molecules to form a more stable activated complex with a lower activation energy. A heterogeneous catalyst, on the other hand, is in a different phase in the reactants, and it works by holding one re reactant molecule in the proper orientation for the reaction to occur, and sometimes also to help to start break the bonds. It's thought that polar stratospheric clouds containing solid ice particles serve as heterogeneous catalysts that help release more chlorine radicals over the poles of the Earth. And this appears to be why we see the ozone hole over these particular regions. Another example of a heterogeneous catalyst is the catalytic converter in your car. So the catalytic converter contains solids like platinum and palladium on a high surface area ceramic substrate. And these catalysts help speed up reactions between harmful incomplete combustion products in the exhaust, like nitrogen oxides, into less harmful substances like nitrogen and water vapor. So we go from dirty emissions to cleaner emissions. Finally, biological enzymes are classic examples of catalysts at work in living organisms. Enzymes are large protein molecules which bind substrates or reactant molecules in their active sites. When the substrate binds the active site, the intermolecular interactions between it and the enzyme, such as hydrogen bonding and dispersion forces, help lower the activation energy of the transition complex so that the reaction just occurs more quickly as a result. So substrates fit into the active site of the enzyme like a key into a lock. That's a common analogy for enzyme-substrate relations. For after the reaction occurs, the products of the reaction are then released from the active site, leaving the enzyme in its original form. And enzymes are extremely specific. They usually catalyze a single type of reaction. They're also very efficient. They can speed up the rate of a biochemical reaction by a factor of a billion. So the presence of enzymes can give organisms a great deal of control over which reactions occur in the body and when. To make a particular reaction occur, the organism can produce or activate the appropriate enzyme for that reaction. It's important to note that the reactions we see in the laboratory or in our everyday lives as one single process are often the result of multiple steps. And a reaction mechanism is simply the proposed series of these elementary steps that add together to give us the one reaction we observe. And oftentimes it's impossible to isolate these individual elementary steps or see the intermediates that might form. So we refer to the mechanisms outlining the individual collisions as a proposed series of steps that explain how the reaction occurs. And as such, proposed mechanisms need to be validated to confirm that they fit our experimental observations. The way we do this is by predicting rate laws for our proposed elementary steps and comparing them to the experimentally observed rate law we have for the net process. Consider a reaction between three molecules like this one. One molecule of hydrogen reacts with two molecules of iodine monochloride. And they produce two molecules of hydrogen chloride gas and one of iodine. 
Now remember that the collision model states that reactions occur when molecules collide with enough energy and in the correct orientation. The probability of all three of these molecules colliding at the same time with the correct energy and the correct orientation is pretty low. For an appreciable reaction rate for this type of process, it's much more likely that the collisions occur in a series of steps. So let's look at one possible mechanism or series of collisions for this reaction. So first, hydrogen can collide with one iodine monochloride molecule, producing one molecule of hydrogen chloride and one of hydrogen iodide. The hydrogen iodide can then collide with another molecule of iodine monochloride in a second step to produce more hydrogen chloride and an iodine molecule. So the elementary steps represent each individual collision that occurs as part of the net reaction. And as such, they cannot be broken down into simpler steps. And notice that each step is also classified as slow or fast. This is based on predictions of the activation energy associated with the formation of the activated complex or transition state for each individual collision. So the collision that will have the highest activation energy is cl classified as the slowest step in the mechanism, and the others are classified as faster. Notice the that if we add the two elementary steps together, we also get the observed net reaction. So hydrogen iodide is a product in step one and then a reactant in step two. Since it's both a reactant and a product in the same amount, it cancels itself out when we add the two steps together, and it does not show up in the overall reaction. So it's a reaction intermediate for this proposed mechanism. When we add together everything else, we end up with one hydrogen molecule reacting with two iodine monochloride molecules to produce two hydrogen chloride molecules and one iodine. This is the same as our observed reaction. So if we wanted to validate this mechanism, there are two conditions that have to be met. The first is that the elementary steps of the mechanism have to sum to give us the overall reaction, just as we saw with our proposed mechanism on the last slide. The second is that the rate law predicted by the slowest step in the mechanism has to be consistent with the experimentally observed rate law. So in most mechanisms, one step occurs significantly more slowly than the others because it has a higher activation energy. We call this the rate determining step. Consider it like a bottleneck in traffic or when a herd of cattle are moved through a narrow cattle chute. The cattle are reduced to one narrow lane and as a result, they slow down. Their overall rate of movement is limited by the slowest cattle passing through that chute. And the slowest step in a reaction mechanism has the same effect on the overall rate of the reaction product formation ultimately can't occur any faster than the rate at which the slowest step in the mechanism occurs. As a result, the rate law of the overall reaction is actually the rate law associated with the slowest elementary step in that reaction. So each elementary step in the mechanism is like its own little reaction with an associated activation energy and a rate law. But how do we predict rate laws for elementary steps when we can't experimentally see the individual steps of a mechanism? Well, since each elementary step represents an individual collision of molecules, we can deduce the rate law or predict it simply from the number of molecules colliding. Let's look at some general examples. So say that we have one molecule of A decomposing in an elementary step of a reaction mechanism. So this is known as a unimolecular step because it only involves one reactant molecule. 
And the rate law associated with this one step is first order. It depends only on the concentration of that one molecule. Another way of stating this is that the coefficient on A in the elementary step becomes the exponent on the concentration in the predicted rate law. If we have two molecules of A colliding in an elementary step, well, the rate is now going to be dependent upon the concentration of both of those molecules, the amounts that are actually colliding. So both of those molecules have to be present in the rate law predicted for that. So our rate law is actually second order with respect to A. We also talk about this type of elementary step as bimolecular because it involves a collision between two molecules. Now, if the step involved two different molecules, say A and B, it would still be bimolecular. It's still two different molecules, but now the predicted rate law is going to be first order with respect to A and first order with respect to B. This is because we only have one molecule of A and one molecule of B colliding uh, every time this collision happens. So first order, Another way of stating this is that the assumed coefficients of one on A and B in our elementary steps turn into the coefficients, the exponents, excuse me, on A and B in the rate law. Now notice that while this reaction is first order with respect to each of the individual reactants, it is second order overall, reflecting the fact that it is a bimolecular process. It depends upon the collision of two molecules. Now, a termolecular step is one that involves three particles or three molecules colliding all at the same time, and these are exceedingly rare in elementary steps. But there are three different possible arrangements, and they're represented here. You can have all three of the same type of molecule colliding, in which case our rate law is predicted as being third order with respect to that molecule. So third order with respect to A in this case. If there are two of one type of molecule and one of a different type colliding, then the rate law is predicted to be second order with respect to the one that we have two of and first order with respect to the one that we have one of. So in this example, we have two A molecules and one B all colliding at the same time. So it's second order with respect to A and first order with respect to B. It's termolecular overall, which means that the overall rate law is considered third order. So two plus one gives us three overall. And finally, if we have three different types of molecules all colliding at the same time, then the predicted rate law would be first order with respect to each of those different molecules. But third order overall, reflecting the fact that we've got three molecules all colliding at once. Now, it's important to note that we can only predict rate laws this way for elementary steps of a reaction mechanism. The overall net reaction that we see in the lab for most processes is the sum of several elementary steps. And the rate law for the net process will only reflect the rate law of the slowest step in the process. Since the reactants of the slowest step may not match the final reactants in the net process, the experimentally observed rate law for the net process cannot be predicted from the final net equation. Let's consider another reaction and its mechanism. Here, nitrogen dioxide reacts with carbon monoxide to produce nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide in the net observed process. And we can measure and determine an experimentally observed rate law for this net process that's second order with respect to nitrogen dioxide. Carbon monoxide does not influence the reaction rate at all. And this is because carbon monoxide is not part of the rate determining step. 
So here's the reaction mechanism showing the elementary steps and the individual collisions that add up to this net process. In the first slow step, we only have two molecules of nitrogen dioxide colliding. They form an intermediate nitrogen trioxide and a nitrogen monoxide molecule. Carbon monoxide, our other reactant in the net process, is actually not introduced until the second step of this mechanism. So since the first step is slower than the second step, it's the one that ends up influencing the overall observed rate law for this process. Now, the first step is slower than the second step because its activation energy is higher. And this is a good example of an appropriate energy diagram for this reaction mechanism with a higher first step activation energy. Let's look at an example for validating a mechanism. And here we'll deal with a simple reaction. Two molecules of A react with one of a bimolecular molecule, B2. And it produces two molecules of AB. The experimentally observed rate law is actually first order with respect to both A and our B2 molecule. So to explain this observed rate law, the following two-step mechanism has been proposed. In the first slow step, an individual molecule of A reacts with one of B2 to produce our product molecule AB and a reaction intermediate of a single atom of B. In the second step, which occurs more quickly, the second A molecule and the B molecule interact to produce another one of our products, AB. Now to validate the mechanism, we have to make sure that the elementary steps add up to the observed net reaction and that the rate law predicted for the slow step matches the observed rate law for the process. So first we add the two steps together to see if the sum matches the observed reaction. So the B atoms cancel each other out because they are reaction intermediates. And our summed process from the reaction mechanism is exactly the same as our observed reaction. Next, we'll determine the rate law for the elementary steps We'll do both the slow and the fast step here just to reinforce the concepts, but really you only need to do this for the proposed slow step when validating a me mechanism. So for the first step, one A molecule collides with one B2. This implies a second order overall, but first order with respect to A and the B2 molecule. For the second step, we have one molecule of A colliding with one of B. And so this again is second order overall, but first order with respect to A and B. All right, so the first step is our rate determining step. It's the slow one. So this is the one that we just have to double check. Does it match what we observed experimentally? And it does. So this mechanism is considered valid. The reaction mechanism adds up to the observed reaction and the rate law for the slow step is the same as the observed rate law. In summary, catalysts are substances that speed up a reaction by providing an alternative mechanism for the process with lower activation energies. And reaction mechanisms describe the individual elementary steps or collisions that result in the net reaction we observe. So the rate laws of elementary steps can be determined from the number of molecules colliding in the step. And reaction mechanisms are validated when the individual steps add up to the observed reaction and the rate law for the slowest step is consistent with the observed rate law.